You're listening to Inside Public Procurement by Bonfire, a show celebrating the unique stories and heroic efforts of those on the front lines of public procurement. Each episode, we bring you the latest trends, tips, and real stories from procurement trailblazers like you, who work tirelessly to bring positive impact to the agencies and communities you serve. Together, let's elevate the field of public procurement to new heights. Now, pull up a chair and let's gather around the bonfire. Our show is about to begin. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time it is you're listening to this podcast. This is Inside Public Procurement. My name is Tung La and I am a client support agent as well as the podcast producer at Bonfire, an e-procurement solution used by over 500 public agencies in North America. I'm joined today by Julie Smith, who is currently working as a strategic sourcing specialist at University Health Network in Toronto. Julie has over 15 years of procurement experience in both public and private sectors. She has led both corporate and regional projects and is an expert in the application of the broader public sector procurement directives. UHN has provided Julie the opportunity to lead a number of innovative procurement, including integrated project delivery, IPD, and competitive dialogue. Julie holds several certifications in procurement and is professional project manager, or a PMP as they call them. Julie, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. And good morning and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, based on your time zone. How's that? That's I good. It, it, came I off, it. it came off very natural to you. So good morning. <laughs> good morning, Julie. Let's go ahead and get started with talking about the morning and how you just couldn't wait to do a morning podcast episode. You're like, Tongue, you're welcome. We got to do an 8 a.m. <laughs> I was like, Julie, I'm not even awake yet. And you're like, no, we got to do an 8 a.m. In fact, I'd prefer a 5 a.m. if possible. I could have. I could have. <laughs> no. <laughs> So don't don't open that door. I'm telling you, I could have done it. Should we reschedule so we can do a 5 a.m.? You know what? I would be happy to. OK, see, I called I, your bluff. You called my bluff and I'm afraid I'm afraid. Julie, I, my question to you is, how are you so, so energetic and just ready to go at such early time of the day? You know what? I'm just a morning person. If you talk to me at seven o'clock in the evening, I'm uh, a piece of sponge and I'm just like <laughs> lying there or dead wood or whatever you want to say. But I'm certainly a morning person. So for me, this yeah. morning is much better than something late in the afternoon because I'm just not as zippy. And you know what? Let's face it. I've had a few cups of coffee. So a few cups helps. of coffee. Yeah, that's all that we need to really get yeah. going. I also, I've never heard the term piece of sponge before. Well, you know. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm you're, an innovator. What can I say? That's why you're here. That's why you're here. And you're talking to me. I can't wait for you to give us more metaphors today. Oh, we'll, there'll, we'll be, there'll be many, I'm sure. <laughs> Julie, let's get started with just a question that we ask every podcast guest that comes on the show. And that's, I just want you to talk about your journey into procurement a little bit. Wow. That's a strange one. So I've been in procurement for quite some time now, and there wasn't post-secondary education for supply chain procurement as there is now. So a lot of us seasoned professionals kind of fell into it, which I did completely. I started in manufacturing on the operation side, and there was a big shift from manufacturing in Canada into importing. I started saying, oh, I, I need to do something else. So looking at different options, I was involved in supply chain and scheduling. I was a master scheduler. And just talking to some of my mentors, some you know senior folks in the company, I said, okay, so Mayday, I'm not ready to be unemployed. What should I do? And someone suggested procurement. And I was like, what's that? And not understanding, of course, that I was already in it, you know, <laughs> with warehousing and everything else. I just, you know, no one called it that. And so I started taking courses and I started having conversations and I started speaking to vendors and colleagues about what their experiences are. And then I realized I really liked it. I didn't go to school for that. It was completely, I kind of fell into it and I've been kind of hooked ever since. So I started I in the private sector and then... 2011, I started in the public sector. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I rarely yeah. see people or talk to people who meant to get into procurement from the beginning, yeah. I guess, right? Well, it's, I think there's there's yeah. a couple of folks now that are doing it because, you know, a lot of the, again, the post-secondary education, you can actually, you know, do, I don't know if they're majors, minors or whatever it is, but you can actually take courses within your programs for yes. supply chain. So, you know, we, we have come a far way, but I got to tell you in the beginning, it wasn't so popular and people were still like, what? Yeah. I, I found like yeah. when I was in, in my universe, back in my day, I'm not even that old. <laughs> and, I had, and I had to walk 300 miles. <laughs> That's right. I did remember that the business school at the university I went to had supply chain management. And I asked people in the business majors or whatever you want to call them, yeah. if what that was and if they were going to take it. And they didn't know what that was, even though they were in business, they were just like the money's in finance, the money's in accounting. Yeah. And my parents yeah. want me to become like an accountant, not whatever this yeah. other thing is. So it's interesting. I, I literally met zero people who actually took the major in supply chain, which right. is such a huge thing, especially during the it's, pandemic, right? Yeah, like, <laughs> it's so huge. So huge. And you know what? And it's not just about purchasing. It's not just about sourcing. There's so many, you know, there's logistics. There's so many things. It's so broad supply chain. It's funny you talk about, you know, education and talking to people and no one knows it. For the last, I want to say four, maybe five years, I've been invited to speak at U of T into their medical program because I don't know even now, I think I, I met one gentleman, maybe it must have been like a seminar or something like that. And we were like, hey, we got to talk kind of thing. And he invited me into his class to talk about sourcing and procurement because all these guys are being trained as doctors. They go into the hospital and they have no idea what their obligations are or what their constraints could be. And you know what? They stick me literally in the middle of the room on a in a chair and they have at it. It's just an open forum. So it started off with a little bit more maybe structure and now it's just like, ask your questions. So a lot of these folks are like researchers or they're going into actual medicine as, you know, whatever capacity, but, you know, they're very innovative and they want to know how do we get our products out? How do we do this? So it's just a really diverse, dynamic conversation. And I love it every year. How many people do you get to talk to at one of those things? I feel like there's like what, 100, 200 people. They're, just... they're smaller. There's probably about 100. It's the smaller oh, room. So just it's a not smaller 100 <laughs> people asking you questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it gets a little, it gets a little, and then afterwards there's a lineup, like I'm a superstar. I'm kidding, but yeah, but it's really good. And you know, one of the things that they realized was that, and, and it's only one session a year, but it is actually part of their program now. And I've actually gone back to, I think a couple of different classes, but it's all within that medical program. And they're just seeing the value in, you know, my lasting message for those poor folks is, Find out who your procurement person is and make friends. You're never going to remember everything I say, but just remember that there's an obligation and find out who the person is and then figure out in that organization what the rules are around it. I love it. You know, uh, because otherwise, you know, it's just, it's overwhelming, right? I'm like spouting off. And then there's the greedy folks that ask like 15 questions. I'm like, okay, share the love. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you joked earlier that you weren't a superstar. You're like, I'm a superstar. Just kidding. But you really are. Let's talk about that university health network oh, in Toronto yay. is the fourth yay. best hospital in the world. Yes. That's a huge deal. I feel like I'm talking to to let's see what who's the biggest celebrity right now you're you're like tom holland like you're like uh, <laughs> uh meryl streep right now i'm in the procurement world so it's a big deal let's talk about that a little bit more uhn being the fourth best hospital yes. in the world how does that become to be you know what it's an amazing organization i gotta say and, and i'd like to take more credit than i than i deserve to but when you're working with that kind of organization it just elevates everything and everybody within it right and so it's full of pride i am full of awe of this organization so newsweek puts out these rankings tgh toronto general hospital was ranked fourth in the world and again the only top hospital in canada the top 10 here's why I kind of copied and pasted a few kind of world first. First clinical use of insulin, first successful single and double lung transplants, first transplant using ex vivo lung perfusion system. I don't expect anyone to know what that is, but basically because of uh, we have a huge transplant division, it was developed by a, a surgeon at Toronto General, and it, it's a, a way of preserving the lungs outside of the body 
and keeping them alive so that way they can evaluate them for transplant. So, you know, you think of all that timely, you think of all that, that kind of good stuff. So that was like world changing. And also the first successful direct stimulation of a heart that stopped beating. So this was the kind of the start of all the pacemakers. So that is just one or two, three, four or five. I could go on and on about all the accolades and all the great things. We're also Canada's largest research hospital. So that's really important. And they've been number one in Canada since they started that ranking, which was probably over 10 years ago. So, um, you know, it's just a really amazing place to work. And, you know, you're just surrounded with really smart people. And then we also have Princess Margaret, which is top 10 in the world for specialized. We specialize in uh, cancer care. And so that's another huge thing because there's a lot of really big cancer centers around the world. And to be able to be part of that top 10, obviously, you know, Canada is very lucky. Yeah, no very kidding. Lucky. Like when you're saying yeah. that, I'm like, I feel, I, know. A, I feel a sense of pride. I'm like, yes, I'm... I'm close to Toronto, that kind of thing. That's counts. right. That's right. <laughs> I I made an impact on UHN somehow. That's it. Yeah, well, by doing this. By, by doing, doing this, 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 doing this. <laughs> oh, does that make me a celebrity? Will I get a room it of does. 100 people? It okay. Does. It does. I'll, be, I'll be able to answer zero of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm a mouthpiece. I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. <laughs> yeah. Julie, that's such an incredible thing that you, yeah. you're able to list just a small portion of what UHN so has delivered and given to the world already. Yeah. I want to talk about how your team, the procurement team, challenged the status quo in a procurement environment and just expand on that a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, my segue will be our values and vision and purpose and all that kind of good stuff from an organizational perspective is the patient always comes first. And so that is something that we keep in mind when we're procuring as well. And so that's my little natural kind of segue. And it's just really, again, working with this type of organization, you elevate yourself to kind of meet that challenge, right? And so really simply said, we challenge the status quo. We are mandated by public procurement rules in, in Ontario. It's the broader public sector we fall into. And we are mandated by those directives to ensure that we are conducting ourselves in an open, fair and transparent manner. Public procurement is challenging at times. I'm trying to figure out the right word because it, it can be very rigid if you allow it to be. And when you're working for cutting edge organizations, you can't sit there and say, hey, low bid wins. That's not the conversation that anyone wants to hear. They want to say, okay, so this is first in Canada, first in the world. How do we get it? And so you really have to challenge yourself on methodologies on how are you going to get that outcome and within, you know, working within that framework. And I think that's where it can get a little scary. A lot of organizations are risk averse at healthcare. Of course we are, but we have, you know, education is a huge part of UHN and innovation. And so we push ourselves and, and so it's welcomed, not without proper due diligence and all that kind of good stuff, but we're not afraid to kind of push the envelope and saying, okay, so here's a framework. How can we do that? So you mentioned in my intro, thank you very much, IPD, Integrated Project Delivery and CD. So Integrated Project Delivery started in the States and I want to say San Francisco, Howard Ashcroft, Google it if you're interested in it. We did that in 2014, so which is a form of uh, construction. And I can, I'll can i give you a couple of highlights of it, but this is before there was any Canadianized contract. So we had to create that ourselves. It was only done in the States. It was you know, a one-sided type thing. We needed to Canadianize it. We needed to tweak the traditional toolkit to match what we needed or wanted for our organization to, again, help mitigate risk. And that was before the Canadian construction, CCDC, I don't know what their full thing is, but they actually have a IPD contract format now. So it's part of the Canadian construction kind of toolkit there. And it's CCDC 30, if anyone is interested in looking at that. But now it's become part of it. But we did it before anything because we were trying to figure out what the heck. Someone must have went to a seminar and heard about it. And literally it was a Google and it was me pulling information, you know, reading white paper, engaging legal. When I say me, you know, obviously it wasn't just me my, by myself or anything, but certainly I was the person who was fortunate to read all the white papers to say, okay, yeah, I think we can do it. But those are the kinds of things that we do. We pushed ourselves to do it. And IPD is so different from a construction standpoint because it brings in all the major players at the front end before the contracting, the final contracting. And it's a multi multi-organizational contract. 
where it's the owner, the the main player on the design front, but it also brings in architects and other trades. And so everyone's got skin in the game. So anyways, it's really interesting. If anyone in the audience, again, IPD, integrated project delivery method, take a look. It's really interesting. The other one that we did that I'd like to brag about is competitive dialogue. We started doing that in 2016. There's been a few organizations throughout Canada that have done it. I want to say that we do it the most at this point, just we're really comfortable. This is another one that we looked at what people were doing. It didn't quite fit what we wanted to do. We were fortunate enough to be introduced by someone in New Zealand that had done it before. And New Zealand is one of the folks that are in the forefront of doing that. So again, you know, Google is your best friend. And we had to educate. We, we myself and a, a lawyer, external lawyer, Debbie Shapiro Prop, I'll give her some love there. We created that toolkit from scratch because there wasn't anything. So here it is in a nutshell. It's a three-phase procurement process. The first is a request for supplier qualifications. So in there, it's a very open kind of high level a request for supplier qualifications. You shortlist, and we'll call it three for the sake of the conversation, and you debrief and you close it off and all that kind of good stuff. The second phase is the actual competitive dialogue. And this is where the magic happens. This is where you are having commercially confidential conversations with the shortlisted vendors. So you're in your iron box and you are actually, think of it as a co-designing. So, but the very first experience, and I've done it a number of times since then, but my very first experience that we did was for storage and compute. We had to update our infrastructure from an enterprise-wide standpoint. And the digital teams are very aware and concerned about obsolescence and all that kind of good stuff. And we were like, no, we got to do a longer term agreement. we got to do this. So, and no one knew what we were trying to make them do either. Right. So, sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. That's okay. I like hearing about this. It's so fascinating. Okay. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. And so they were naysayers and we finally convinced them, no, because I'm not doing this every two years. We're going to do a a 10 year agreement. We're going to do this and we're going to do this and we're going to try this new model. Wink, wink, you know, hang on tight. And so what ended up happening in that competitive dialogue session, if you can imagine, we were in a room and there was only five from the vendor side and five from our side, not counting myself. We kept the team very small because it's not a C-suite conversation. It's not a sales pitch. It is literally, how is this going to work? And the reason that you do the competitive dialogue is when it's really hard to come up with the requirements yourself, when it's really complex, when it's really high dollar value. It's not for every day, you know, we got to buy band-aids type of thing. It, it's just for big stuff. And what I saw was amazing because the people that I was with Literally vendors and UHN folks were shoulder to shoulder whiteboarding, trying to figure out how is this actually going to work, physically work. And so what ends up happening is the vendors can ask point blank questions. We can ask point blank questions. And because it's commercially confidential and we actually went to the extent of signing a mutual non-disclosure. Because we wanted to build the trust. We wanted to ensure that people were comfortable and kind of opening the books just to make it really productive. And so what ends up happening? So typically, you know, you have like, let's say three, two hour meetings with each vendor. And they also produce a outline solution proposal. So as you're going through all this, they're updating what they think is going to give us the end solution. And so you have all this information. You have all this information within a compliant procurement methodology, which is amazing. Part of the problem that I think end users have with procurement is that they can't talk to the vendors. You know, you get into the blackout phase and then you're just, it goes silent. And this actually allows you to have that actual dialogue with vendors and really, really specific. And it allows you to get into the weeds because you have the right people around the table. Again, it's not the sales pitch and everyone's wearing a tie. It is the guys who are on the floor fixing things that are actually there because they're the ones that know how it's going to actually work. So once that closes off, that's phase two. And then phase three is when you issue the final RFP. And that is only invitational to the folks who were participating in the competitive dialogue. And that's, uh, I'll keep it simple. It's just a regular RFP, so to speak, right? But the thing that really shows through is you understand what your requirements are. So it's a lot quicker process to do the, the final RFP. I think what the original team came back with was they understood what's not possible. Sometimes people think, oh yeah, well, we can just do this or we can do that. But after having all those conversations, you realize, no, that's not possible. And that saves a lot of time. And it also puts together your expectations really neatly in a, in a nice little bow because you actually are going in really well informed. So it was a great experience. And of course, now then afterwards, and for the vendors as well, I got a lot of really positive feedback. No one ever wanted to do a regular RFP. And I said, well, that's not going to happen. This is a long process. 
This is time consuming for the procurement professional, but also for the end users, right? There's a lot of meetings, there's a lot of front work, but the back end is just really sweet because you know where you stand, you know what you want, and you know how to get it. My God, I had so many follow up questions to you, but like as I you're saying it, forever. you're, you're, no, 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 no. I was just going to say I had follow up questions, but every time I was about to chime in, you just answered it right away. It's like you've been doing uh, this for a very long time. You know, uh, I, I've, I've, I've talked about this quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, yeah I, you know what? I've been privileged. Like people want to know about it. They want to educate themselves. And I've spoken at different seminars and, yeah. and I've gone to even lawyers offices to speak to them just because they're interested. And, you know, people want to know, and there's nothing wrong with understanding other people's lessons learned. Right. No kidding. And I was just going to say the only useful, I shouldn't say useful. The only thing I could think of <laughs> by the, after you've taken all of my follow-up questions was huh, <laughs> competitive dialogue sounds like a slam poetry contest. That's, as, <laughs> that's all I had. <laughs> so, and clearly awesome. it wasn't that. So, <laughs> I mean, that if it awesome. ended I it. with slam poetry, it, it hmm. sounds like Julie might have some slam poetry to share with us right now. No. Okay. <laughs> you could, if you want. That's, that's, a, that's an evening conversation. <laughs> that's right. Not a morning conversation. <laughs> totally right. different. Totally right, different. Right. When you're in a uh, piece of sponge mode is when your That's poetry right. comes out. That's right. <laughs> Amazing. So you really, it just sounds like it's as simple, not as simple, but you really just used Google to kind of get ahead of the curve in a lot of ways. You And in a lot of ways. And, and you know, again, it, it's not that simple, but I got to tell you, you know, you hear something by being active in your profession in whatever capacity. And then Google was my best friend. And literally that's what we did. And of course you had to parse it down. But again, you know, reaching out outside of your comfort zone, we had conversations with the government of New Zealand. They were so gracious. And I don't know what time the, the calls were because obviously there's a bit of a time difference. But we had a number of calls with there and they were so helpful and they were so gracious. And it really helped us understand how to move forward. Yeah. So it's almost as if just having the awareness in your field of anything new happening. And then as soon as you hear something, you're like, what is that? And you dig a little deeper. Yeah. And yeah, if it's something sure. that you can pursue, then you do it. And mm -hmm. if it's not, then you're like, oh, well, at least I was on top of things trying to get ahead of it. For sure. You know, we did contract management. So this is like a construction project. And, and so I'll just the CCDC 5B, which is for a construction manager. And we had never done it at UHN. And again, this is going back a few years. And so I went on, I just Googled it and found that Sheridan College had done it. And I found the right people. And I said, okay, talk to me. And we had a great conversation. They told me, you know, what worked for them, what didn't lessons learned. And I was like, okay, we can do this. So just don't be afraid, you know? I love that. Get some bravery, yeah. get some courage That's in you a little bit. <laughs> it's a good pep be talk. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get into something that I just heard about and learned about, and I'm kind of not as familiar. So if you could talk about the AEP awards yes. and also you're just at NASPO too. So two acronyms I'm pretty unfamiliar with, if you want to expand on that. <laughs> for sure. So AEP awards. So when we're talking about kind of challenging the status quo and thanks for bringing me back in there, because I could talk about that other stuff forever. One of the other things that we do is we push ourselves to improve. So we're part of the Canadian Public Procurement Council. So CPPC, Google it. And that's how we were introduced to this AEP award. And basically what it is, is a way for you to stay on top of what's happening in the profession. So we have applied and been awarded for the last four years, the AEP award, which is the Achievement of Excellence in Procurement. So it's a national award. When I say national, it's really, it's American. I don't mean to say it in that tone. It's American. And so it's not, it's not <laughs> North American. They consider it national. There are a number of Canadian public procurement organizations that have been successfully doing this. The reason I want to break a little bit about the applied for and were awarded Typically, folks don't get the award the first year out. The first time you do it, it's, it's pretty uh, overwhelming. 
it's out of 200 points. And there's questions that talk about, you know, sourcing, procurement, back office, a bunch of stuff. And you've got to provide tons of backup, like real, you can't just say, hey, well, we do this. No, they want to see how do you do this? And how are you engaging suppliers? How are you being more environmentally mindful? How are you incorporating social procurement? So it goes on and on and on and on. But what it does, it makes us look at our processes and make tweaks, one for the following year so we get the points. But more importantly, it's bringing to highlight a few things that we hadn't considered. And so sometimes, you know, it's easy when you're busy and that, that you're not thinking about how can we do things better, or you're only looking at your processes from a procurement standpoint. You know, we have a doing business with UHN from a procurement standpoint now, where we hadn't had that before, or we didn't have it, maybe we had it, but it wasn't as extensive. And so we're doing things like that and we're putting it in our signature. So that way, when we are speaking with vendors or other folks, there is that tagline there so they can go there in the future. So it's just really, made us question how we do things. It talks about continued education all the time. It talks about, you know, are you active? How are you doing value procurement? And so again, even if you're not, and it's varied size of organization, like we're a large organization, but it's got the smallest cities that you can think of who are as successful. And it's, again, it pushes you to do better. And I think that's amazing. And, and then you get an award for it. You know what I mean? Is it a medal? Is it a trophy? What is it? A tattoo? It is a trophy. Okay. It is a beautiful, I don't know what kind of trophy it is, but it's a a trophy and we've got four and we're going for our fifth this year. Oh my God. So we even got, we even did it during COVID, if you could imagine. That's incredible. Um, Yes. Yes. And so it's just, again, I think, you know, for organizations who are not, maybe don't have the time or the interest, I think it's really interesting to even go on their website to look at the questions and answer those from an internal perspective to say, okay, so maybe, you know, when you're doing your planning and goals for your department, maybe those are things to consider. Anyways, that's my three cents on that one. I don't want to get too preachy on it, but <laughs> it really has elevated us internally on things that we hadn't considered, which I always think is just a bonus, right? Absolutely. And yeah. if you get a trophy out of it, then Slash hey, bragging rights, right? And so, bragging rights. But you know what, you that type of stuff, it just makes you, I feel like you get awarded for something you worked hard at and, you know, it just yeah. inspires you to continue yeah. to push yourself as an organization and as a team. So uh, yeah, I, I totally love agree. that. I am uh, yeah. a little disappointed you don't have the trophies just sitting in the background of your of your Zoom no, call. No, my, my boss but... has that. Oh, okay, my boss okay. has that, yeah. yeah. You only get yes, it one I'm day probably... of the week. Yeah, Not even. <laughs> he like tracks that thing. Was there, okay, is it left yet? We want to see it. Yeah, so it's um, pretty special. We have a you know relatively small group and to be able to do that, honestly, and it absolutely is a group effort. So it's something that the whole department can take pride in, which is really awesome. That's really, really great stuff. How about NASPO? Did you want to talk well, about that some yeah, more? I'm going to touch base on that one. So I had the privilege of being invited to NASPO Exchange 2022. And we had some interaction with NASPO. It's the National Association of State Procurement Officials. So again, this is an American organization. We did start some conversations with them during peak of COVID. Actually, we were supposed to go to Nashville, their, their previous summit. And COVID smacked us in the face and we said, no. So we have had some interaction with them and hoping for some collaboration in that. But what I went to last week, not only was I in Florida and thank you again, warm weather and sunshine. It was awesome. We, myself and my director, we actually took part in their international summit. So we were invited to that, which was amazing. Amazing. So here we are. There was people from Italy. There was people from Mexico. There was people from South America. There was people from the EU. We had a speaker from Scotland. And you know what I got to tell you? We're all facing the same stuff. Doesn't matter where you are. People are at different maturity levels. And it was such a, a positive, great experience. Honest to goodness, I hope they invite me back. But the one thing that was interesting is Hugh and I, my director that I'd gone with, we were kind of at different ends of the table. And so we had our place cards and all that kind of good stuff. And as people were talking about what they were doing and trying to be innovative, we're kind of making faces going, yep, and nodding, saying they're talking about competitive dialogue. It's just everyone talks about it and they call it something different. So then he started talking and this and that. And then, you know, it just all kind of came together. The fact that we're all 
kind of struggling with the same things and we're all trying to push the limits. But this was on an international stage. And so it was just amazing to see what other people are doing. And of course, you know, at that point, you know, I have to send out a bunch of information and I was fortunate. There's a couple of articles out there floating around on competitive dialogue. And so I said I would share those and, and things like that. So people are just wanting to keep that conversation going. So that was just like the very first day. But the NASPO, yeah, I, that's that was my introduction. It was, again, it was amazing. There was a bunch of breakout sessions throughout the week on different, very different, diverse topics. But one of the main things that happened out of this was the actual exchange. And so it's really supplier specific. We'll call it that for right now. So what NASPO tries to do with this exchange is to build the relationships with suppliers and actually give them time with the state procurement officials, which sounds really crazy. But can you imagine how busy these folks are? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So think of a, you know, a CPO of Texas. Yeah, how big Texas is, California, wherever. And these people were from all over. Every state was represented. And the exchange is, think of speed dating. There were a little table set up and the vendors got, I want to say 15, 20 minutes and you had to make an appointment and that time was yours. So it could be, geez, how did we lose that business? Geez, how do we gain some business? How do I get my product in? How do I get my product out? Whatever you wanted to talk about, was your time. And it was one-on-one -on -one time with these folks. And it could have just been, hey, great to see you. We need a follow-up call and this is why. But you actually got that time with the vendors and they did it at no cost to the vendor. That's awesome. Like, yeah. like wow. it, it, it's not a, it wasn't revenue generating, whatever. whatever conference, you event, or whatever, yeah, conference. Yeah. Certainly there was sponsors and what have you, but for those folks that wanted to have that face-to-face, -face, and I'm talking like CPO level, not all of them were the CPOs, but a lot of them were there. A lot of them were speaking, but different levels. And again, at no charge. And I thought that was so commendable that they're so driven to educate and to improve education. I just thought it was amazing. And the things that we learned, of course, now my boss is all like, okay, we need to build a model for us here. So I, every conference there's always more work, right? And so I think that's one of their biggest drivers for this exchange is really to build that relationship with the suppliers. And I just commend them. I think they did such a great job. We're certainly having conversations on how we can work more together. And then also there was really some great discussions on how to expand the international summit as well, because it was, it was so successful and it had such great feedback from everybody who attended. So I think we were all pretty hyped up on how to do that, but you know, I don't think we do that well enough in Canada, at least where I sit. The only time that we get a chance to really talk to vendors on a one-to-one -one direct is during debriefs. And, you know, debriefs are one of my favorite things. And it's, I know it sounds kind of weird, but it's a chance to really have a direct conversation with the vendors about them specifically. Normally it's about that specific procurement, but, you know, as a procurement professional, you know, you can certainly speak to what they could have done better and all that kind of good stuff. But I think one of the things that we do here at UHN is talk about what we also see in the market. Procurement evolves, evaluations evolve, RFP submissions evolve, just like everything else. And I think sometimes vendors get stuck in, this is how we've always done it. And they have a, a template, they change the name and they go through, well, that's not cutting it anymore. And so it's our opportunity to say, hey guys, this is what we're seeing from an evaluator comment, very general, of course. Um, this is what we're seeing from submissions that have been really successful and sharing that. And so we're giving them insight to things that they wouldn't even consider. And so what we want to do is improve the relationship, improve their chances next time, because the more competition, it's better for everybody. Anyways, I think I kind of went off side there, but it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. It's uh, truly, it's all good. There's so many fascinating pieces that you pulled from there. First off, just, I guess there's like a sense of relief in a way that the whole world is kind of going through similar struggles in procurement. Like you're talking yes. about people from across the ocean, you know, like coming yeah. here and you're like, yeah. Oh, cool. Like it's, it's kind of neat to know that we're all in this together Truly. trying to navigate pr what procurement yep. is in this space. Right. So I think yep. that's really awesome. And the fact that like, it just seems like it's such a valuable conference, let's just call it that where vendors and purchasing orgs and important people can kind of talk to each other in this safe and fun environment to hash it out. But you get to talk yeah. to like people you don't usually get to talk to. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. That's, that's really neat. And I just love the yep. idea that NASPO is yep. like, 
professional speed dating. It absolutely <laughs> is. It absolutely is. And, and I got to tell, well, I think I talk about them more at the end as well, but it was my first time there. So it was a great introduction. And again, I think it was the, I don't know if it, I want to say the first international summit. I might be wrong on that. I just thought it was just so valuable for all of us, for all of us that attended. So it was really a very positive experience. That's great. That's great. great. Yeah, it was just awesome. Let's pivot into our final question, sort of. We have one more bonus question afterwards, but <laughs> uh, let's get back into healthcare for a second about UHN. You're all about healthcare, of course. What is your experiences handling the pandemic in healthcare? I mean, that's a challenging thing. It was a challenge for everybody, but I, I got to say healthcare, you know, we have a, you know, a little extra star on that one on how we had to navigate that. And we continue to navigate. It's not done yet. I, I know people don't, don't want to hear it, but it's still here. Yep. It's not going away yet, but certainly we're, anyways, we won't even get into the stats. No one watches the news. Um, you know, it was uh, unprecedented for everybody involved. Like whether or not you needed car parts or hand sanitizers, masks, or anything in between, honestly, like there was just challenges for everybody. Or you lost your staff because everyone was sick, you know? So we had a lot of highs and lows. And I would say the biggest low and the biggest concern and, and um, yucky, insert favorite word, situations were being confronted with vendors selling either fraudulent or uh, inferior product. You know, I had somebody and I'll, I'll keep it, I'll try to keep it short. I had a vendor. So think of frontline workers, think of N95 masks. I think everyone knows what an N95 is now. So I had a vendor who in all intents and purposes wanted to help. Masks were not his core business. He had somebody overseas that he knew and he had a deal for us and he could get us masks and, and wanted to do it and this and that. And so I had a conversation, said, okay, give us samples and, and this and that. So we had created PPE working groups. We had approval processes. It had to be screened by people before it, it even would be able to take the next step. So anyways, I'd gone through all that sent it to the group and they said, no, these won't work. We can't have them. And again, keep in mind, this is for frontline workers. So do you really want a frontline worker going in with a inferior mask when they are on a COVID ward? Like that's a yeah. death sentence. Honestly, when you put it into perspective, it really is. So I went back to this vendor and said, I am sorry, it didn't pass our testing and thank you very much. And you know, they were like, well, this hospital is using it and this and that. And I said, that's, that's fine. We're not. And so he got a little irate with me and couldn't believe that I had the audacity to refuse this. Then, you know, he had product and didn't you see the news and blah, 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 blah. And so I kind of let that sit. I think that I want to say that was like a Friday, you know, and over the weekend, it was somewhere in the EU where it hit the headlines that there was hundreds of thousands, if not millions, masks that were fraudulent that they got. And so they had no masks because they got gypped. Oh my God. Right. Yeah. And so this vendor on Monday emailed and said, oh, Julie, I'm sorry. But because he realized like I wasn't being difficult. I wasn't being dismissive of his efforts. It was, dude, this is healthcare. These are frontline workers. These are moms, dads, brothers, sisters. You know what I mean? Like we're not taking chances. And he finally understood. And he actually called and, and just said, I'm so sorry. He was so apologetic because he just didn't realize what the ramifications were if the masks weren't up to snuff, right? And so he was just really irritated because he had gone to these extents, you know, to, to try to help, right? And he totally got it. He goes, you know what? I'm tapping out of this one. I don't want to, I, I got to be able to sleep at night. And not that he didn't have confidence what it is, but like with who he was working with, it was just realizing what that impact was and knowing that he was not qualified to make those kind of purchases. And so that's kind of a high and a low in between. But one of the other highs that we really experienced throughout and we continue to experience was like donations. My goodness, the donations from so many people, organizations and trying to help and trying to make it easier, you know, whether it's food vouchers or whether it's masks or hand sanitizer or whatever, even scrubs. If you can imagine, we were running out of scrubs because of, again, you know, with COVID and, and everything else, it's not like you can be, you know, walking around afterwards, right? But let me tell you about some of the things that we kind of push the status quo, if you will. And I'll, I'll give you an example and you can cut me off if I start getting too long on it. But think about last year. I think it was last year. It could have even been the year before. Who knows anymore? Where we, we set up mobile clinics for the vaccination. So throughout the GTA, there was a bunch of pop-ups and people could go in their neighborhoods, especially marginalized neighborhoods where some people don't have access because of different hours 
or they just, to be quite honest, they don't have the faith in the healthcare system to be going there. There's just, there's a lot of things going on. And so we were part of, and it wasn't just UHN. It was, it was a, a group effort by a bunch of health organizations. We were leading a lot of it in the logistics side of it, but everyone pulled in together and we were administrating the vaccination. But here's the thing. We have hot summers and they're getting hotter every year. So what we soon realized is we're having people who are waiting in line five, six hours. There's no shade. There's no water. There's no nothing. So I was challenged with, Julie, go find us stuff. (laughs) 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 Go ahead. Handle it, handle it, handle it. So yeah, Google. I did Google and I tried a lot of places and in their defense, I'm sure that they get called upon often, but we were in a panic stage. I was a little frantic. Once you realize, again, people are standing in line that they're going to have heat stroke before they get a vaccination and we didn't want them not to get their vaccination. So I don't know how I stumbled across it, but I did. And there's an organization that is for the Bottled Water Association. I want to say of Canada. So I stumbled upon them. I reached out and I can't remember the lady's name, but God, no, she was so helpful. She said, oh, I got a couple of cell numbers for you. I got a cell number, not a website, not a contact. I got the cell number. I made a few phone calls. And I'm going to say, I know that they've changed their name and I can't remember what it is, but Nestle stepped up to the plate. They provided us with water the entire time those mobile clinics were going for free. For So helpful. That's so helpful. Like imagine that. Like we're talking skids and skids and skids. So water is really, really heavy. Yeah, really heavy. It's, I mean, I've been working out. Oh. I can le- I can lift some water. Skids? Mm, maybe two skids at most with my arms. <laughs> 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 no, that's heavy. That is heavy. That's heavy stuff. So there's an organization called Trucks for Change that my contact at Nestle's advised me of. And so I called Trucks for Change and said, hey, here we are. Trucks for Change is a transportation, a nonprofit transportation service that goes out and provides donated truck time. We didn't pay for our water. We didn't pay for our transportation. This was all donated. That's incredible. Like, is that not, is that that's, incredible? That's so nice. It's it's so nice to hear when the world's like coming together out of it the greater good. It makes you good. believe. It makes me believe. (laughs) That's right. Right? That's right. I guess it's hard not to be a little pessimistic in the last two years of the pandemic. But when you hear stories like that, where honestly organizations are giving, you know, the services that they have available to them to help the greater good. It's like, that's really cool. Yeah, really, really cool. And and there was no question about it. And honestly, it just, it was what, it was the little lights that we needed to be able to just keep on going. Because, you know, there was kind of days where you were like, Ugh, I'm done. Ugh, poor me. And then, you know, all of a sudden I, it hit me. I'm like, Julie, people are dying. Put in perspective, young lady. I say young, but <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and you, you kind of forget because you're just like, oh, it's too much. Like we were working seven days a week, you know, 15, 20 hours. It felt like 15 hours, easy hours all over the place. And I have tons of examples of that, of how people kind of came to the table and really helped us by Google, you know, these introductions and these, these things, because desperate times, desperate measures. And so we were cold calling people, right. And think outside of the box folks. And, and you'll be amazed to what jumps out at you. It's awesome. I love ending this podcast on this high note of inspiration yeah. here. I also feel like this podcast is like half a plug for Google, which doesn't need plugs. I know you <laughs> but, can take that out. You no, can take no. it out. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, <laughs> I was Googling stuff as we were talking, being like, what there does this go. acronym mean? <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I'm terrible with that. No, no, no. It is all good. Julie, I could honestly talk to you for much, much longer, but of course, I think we're both late for other meetings that were supposed to happen (laughs) ages ago, but I don't even care. Forget those meetings. It's about us right now. That's right. I'd like to end on what is the number one piece of advice you'd give to people starting their career in public procurement? Network. Network and take advantage of public procurement organizations in your area. So there are tons. And if you're not familiar, I won't say the G word again. No, you got it. (laughs) Okay. Google public procurement in your area, dash in your area. And you'll be amazed how many organizations are out there. If you're considering it, if you're just starting out, there's so many across North America, but there's tons in Canada because I'm speaking from Canada. So NASPO is, is one we talked about earlier. They have tons of education. A lot of it's free. Go on their website and check it out. Not the exchange, just NASPO. And they've got a procurement university. So go take a look at that. CPPC is another one that has a lot of education. Supply Chain Canada, 
which is they have tons of education and do seminars. The procurement office, Paul Emanuele, a lot of people will be familiar with his name. The procurement school is another one. And yeah, I could go on and on and on. But there's a lot of places where you don't necessarily have to be a member to, to use their services or to gain access. But educate yourself and find out what other people are doing around not just your silo, but beyond and around the world. But there's a lot more in there. I think, you know, if nothing from COVID, it's really highlighted the importance of public procurement and procurement in general on the importance of collaborating, keeping up to date what people are doing and putting yourself out there to educate and find out, okay, so how can we make improvements? Yeah, that's great. That's great. The conversation today, and I've known this for a while, which is like procurement is such a a thing that most people don't know about. I whenever I talk about, <laughs> I just don't usually bring it up sometimes because it's I have to always explain it from the beginning yes, what procurement <laughs> is. Whenever someone's like, "What is that?" I'm like, "Oh, here we go again," and I'm trying to get that sentence shorter every time to like, how do I like explain this well without having to give three examples of what it is? Yeah, you just say I buy stuff, and that's it. Uh, Oh, that's... And then they lose interest and then you move on the conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because they're expecting you to tell them a very interesting story. And you're like, I buy stuff. Yeah. I'm like, well, I yeah. buy stuff too. Your Amazon yeah. order does not count as buying yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but it is interesting to me because like through our conversation here is like, it's so apparent that procurement is everywhere. It's just like that hidden hero that's in every organization that's in government, education and healthcare that is, you know, it's changing the world. It really is. And we're really doing is. that. Like, I mean, you're doing that right now. You're working in healthcare, but everybody is playing a part in this. That's really keeping the, the gears turning on how everything operates. Cause honestly, without procurement, we wouldn't have anything <laughs> like you wouldn't have anything. You're absolutely right. <laughs> right. You're absolutely right. It's uh, interesting to think about it like that. Anyways, anyways, I'm blabbering now. Look at me. Okay, so that's <laughs> today. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, since it's my turn, unfortunately, I do have to close out the show. So thank you all for listening to today's episode of Inside Public Procurement. We couldn't have done it without our procurement celebrity, Julie Smith, everyone. <laughs> so Julie, do you have any way for people to contact you at all? LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. And do they find that through Google? Do you know? I'm not sure. You find everything through Google. I'm trying to avoid the Google plugs. Yeah, yeah. Google How me. You... I'm there. LinkedIn. Do you want to spell your name for people who can't spell sure. the Julie it, Smith? It, well, you know what? It's pretty. Um, it is hard. Uh, you it's, know what? It's crafty. I don't always crafty. share the actual correct spelling. So it's Julie, J-U-L-I, no E, and Smith, S-M-Y-T-H. So a Y instead of an I. So that will get you to my LinkedIn and it's been a pleasure. So fantastic. All right, Julie. Well, next time I talk to you, I hope it's at five in the morning and uh, <laughs> don't, don't, don't contact me there. I'll be asleep. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. And we'll see you on another episode of Inside Public Procurement. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Procurement professionals like you are the lifeblood of public sector organizations dedicated not only to supporting your agency, but the constituents you serve. That's why we've created the Inside Public Procurement Podcast here at Bonfire, a unique place where you can share stories and discuss the topics that matter to public procurement pros. From digitization and the future of public procurement to ensuring a fair and transparent process, we're all about finding new strategies to help your agency succeed. Join us at gobonfire.com to learn more. You've been listening to Inside Public Procurement by Bonfire. If you like what you've heard, make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And if you have an idea for an episode or want to come on as a guest, email us at hello at gobonfire.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.